Welcome to Luminescence Common Sense Spirituality, a show designed to share spiritual insights with you so that you can comprehend the universe and how it functions. You are about to experience raised consciousness. This is a place where spiritual principles are shared with the goal of assisting you to expand your understanding of both the seen and unseen worlds. Luminescence Common Sense Spirituality helps you to discern the timeless truths handed down from wise sages through the ages from the airy fairy nonsense that is being taught today. Now, here is your host, Sharon Lynn Wyeth. Welcome to Luminescence Common Sense Spirituality. I'm so pleased that you've decided to join us again today. The beautiful inspirational uh, music and song that you just heard is called Shine, and it's by Dee Lamore. And you can find more of her music on her website. It's D. L-E-M-O-R dot com and her music is just gorgeous and we always end our program with her song that's called Shine. Now our topic today is families. Why do some families get along and others don't? How does the family cause us to grow spiritually? Do we have to get along with our family? Are there karmic ties between family members? Are your current family members also part of your divine soul family? How do soul families form, and what is meant by a soul family? And who gets ahead faster, the solitary monk or the person who's always engaged with family, regardless of their relationships to the individual members of the family? Are the spiritual consequences for ditching your family if you just go, oh, I don't even want to deal with them? So today we want to know all about families from a spiritual point of view. And our special guest today is Lori McQuarrie, who's with us the first week of every odd month. Lori, welcome to Hi. Luminescence. <laughs> Good to be here. Thank you. Lori McQuarrie has been on the Portland and National Psychic Scene since 1985. When she was 18, she was in a horseback riding accident, and she was in a coma for three weeks, and after she woke, her life has never been the same. She began having dreams, like newsreels on black and white film, of violent plane crashes. Shockingly, a few days later, she began seeing television newsreels of these same airline disasters actually happening. Lori McQuarrie has been established as a professional psychic and has gained fame for her work in a series of notable cases. The cases range from missing persons to crime investigations. She had a professional office in Lake Oswego in 1985 and continually until recently when she semi-retired and is living in Central Oregon with her retired former police detective husband of 31 years. Now, I first met Lori in 1999 when she was still in the Lake Oswego area, and I was across the freeway as a school administrator in Beaverton, Oregon. I was astounded by both Lori's accuracy and how detailed she was, and so I'm so pleased that she's here with us today. So, Lori, right off the bat, would you please define what is a soul family to us? Well, my version of it is pretty simple. Um, You know, the soul is a thing that continues continues after we pass on. Thank goodness we have the essence of soul. Souls speak to each other. When we come in different forms, meaning man, woman, you do change, you know, a lot of times the sex you are when you come back in, and by that I mean reincarnationally. There's many, many religions in the world that believe in that. I do. And I think when souls meet again and again and again, there's two ways you can do it. You can feel the presence of other people and embrace them and love seeing them again. Sometimes it's the exact opposite. And that is because there's other previous lifetimes that have not worked out, to put it very, very simply. And I think we get, I always like to think, God gives us an awful lot of chances to get things right. And reincarnation for me made sense when I first learned of it when I was about 19 or 20. And so soul families are families that have been together before, and not always for bad reasons. Sometimes they're great reasons. They just all want to be together again. And it's an individual by individual basis. You can't put everybody under the same screen. But it's amazing and fascinating. I've done, I was just talking to you about doing past life regressions with people. And I had that in my office. I had an office for 40 years in Portland. And it was wonderful listening to people recount what they saw under hypnosis and 
figured out what their relationships were with the folks in their family, why they were so great, or conversely, why they were so ugly. And it can be one or the other. Or somewhere in the middle, right? Sometimes great, sometimes ugly. (laughs) Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because... It'll happen throughout your life. You know, fortunately, if we have children, they usually grow up and marry and bring in other people. And it's it's interesting to hear people's takes on new people becoming family, you know, new daughter-in-law, new son-in-law. Sometimes it's wonderful, and boy, sometimes people have just called me and gritted their teeth and said, how come I don't like this guy? He hasn't done anything. And I said, okay, well, let's talk about it. And if you can just reflect on a past life. I always say the most important lifetime is the one you're in now. Reflection's great. Gather information. You know, maybe in a past life that son-in-law did something to the guy and he remembers it deep down at a soul level. It can be worked out. It can be released. It doesn't mean the bad energy continues to follow. Well, what I think is interesting is you know, the 18 books were taken out of the Bible and didn't make it in there because originally there were 90 books. Mm-hmm. And in the books that were taken out, reincarnation was fully accepted at that time. Yeah. And when you go to Israel, there are literally churches, I've been there, seen them for myself, that have tile floors of the Zodiac on there, which and they speak of reincarnation. Yeah. And so at one time, it was thoroughly understood, both of those things. And totally accept it. But they removed those 18 books and attempted to remove any reference to them. Of course, they didn't get all of them. Um, But they did attempt to remove that. Because when John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, ah, Elijah, come again. Yeah. You know, that's a a reference Uh, to reincarnation. Of course. Well, fortunately, you know, they haven't, they, whoever they be, haven't stamped it out. They can't. And. Because the belief is so strong and so real. And I think, thank goodness, we live in times where it's not attempted to blot it out too heavily. You know, we're able to have wonderful shows like this to exchange ideas and and gather information. You can read on your own. You can decide for yourself. I think there's still people in particular in these difficult times we're in questing and looking. And... I think it's not one size fits all. So some families get along really, really well, and others just like not at all. You know, it's like oil and water. Hmm. So if we look at reincarnation and use that as an explanation for it. So why would we do that to ourselves? How does that help us grow spiritually? Well, I think behavior is at the bottom of it. And, you know, if we have acted out in other lifetimes and not done it right, not been good to people, not been honest or whatever the situation is, and we come back again and circumstances present themselves so that we can reenact that bad behavior in a different way, then we have healed it. You know, every, every single lifetime is so individual. That's what's so fascinating about it. And I think what we have to be careful with, and I want to be sure people understand, this is not punishment. If if I sit with somebody in a session and go, you know, you've been with this sister of years before, you're still not getting along, let me tell you why. And I can get a glimpse of that lifetime. And so the person hopefully says, oh, now I get it. I wasn't very nice to her in a past life, and she's given it back to me. Well, that's loosely it. You know, the present lifetime not only can heal, but it can reformulate. And we get many chances, I think, in every lifetime to do it right, to do the right thing. Well, I look at it that we're all constantly learning and that why we have these lifetimes is to literally gain more insight into oneself and who we are and how we fit into the whole. Mm -hmm. And so... As you look at it from a soul perspective, the majority of us would all say that we've had terrible childrenhood, and 
and we've had those, it doesn't matter how perfect our parents were or imperfect that they were. Parents never live up to a child's expectations of what we want. And so. Sometimes it's the other way around, though, too. <laughs> oh, yes. <You> know. <laughs> and, and we're all meant to, to process. And I always think you start by processing your childhood and understanding yeah. and yeah. forgiving. And that the key is forgiveness, because if we can't forgive, then we're doomed to repeat. Well, let, may I amend a teeny bit of that? Sure. Um, just because it's, it's just my thoughts. But when people ask me about heavy-duty childhoods, and I had one a lot of people have. We've made it through. But people will say, do I have to forgive that parent? And I mean, we're talking heavy-duty stuff sometimes, really bad. And I'm not a psychologist. I have good psychologist friends who told me I should have been. But what I tell people is, Forgive the act, the weakness that caused the act. If that parent who abused you in whatever way drank, was out of control, that's the weakness. Sometimes people just can't or won't forgive. It's very hard for some people. And for some people, when you suggest to them, oh, you've got to forgive that mother or that father because, you know, you just should forgive. Some people can't or won't do it, and then they get more embroiled in feeling bad because they can't let go. So it seems to work when I have suggested to people forgive the weakness that caused it because then they feel, I think, they can move on a little easier. See, and I've redefined the word forgive. To me, if you take it apart, you are for, not against, giving the entire situation back to the universal laws to take care of, that you don't have to carry it in this lifetime. Perfect. I I stand corrected. No, (laughs) I like that. No, I like that. And I'll use that. I had not heard you say that prior. Good. Yeah, because because that way... you've got to give people tools that work. Yes, and, and, and definitely not forgetting. Because by no. remembering, you are making sure that you're progressing you're as you right. go forward. And you're not repeating what you came out of. Right. Because right. some people do that. You know, some people do repeat their childhood almost blindly. And it just, you know, it's a continuation of like an open sore. It just never heals. So do we have to get along with our family? Is that one of our goals? Is that here we've got this conglomerate of different personalities and we're somehow here to figure out how to get along with each one of them or not? No, I, you know, I I don't think you have to do it. I think most people want peace. I think most people want a situation where they may be very different than the other five members of their family, but everybody loves them anyway. You know, no, nothing's perfect. And if you really believe and are open to reincarnation, you realize, because this is what I tell people, we all choose our lifetimes. And there's times, honestly, Sharon, I have scratched my head and said to myself, Lori, what were you thinking? You came in again like this. But it is a choice. So once you accept you've chosen, then you go, boy, there must be a pony in this barn somewhere. It's got to be something good. And it changes the perspective. I don't like people to feel victimized. I, people can victimize themselves. I've done it years ago. Easy to do. Easy to go, oh, poor me. Here we go again. But you do get a hold of yourself and dictate your lifetime the minute you admit you chose it. And we choose the, we choose the situation for the reasons that are best to teach ourselves. Right, and that will cause us to grow. Well, you know, I take a look at a a, a typical family situation, and we've heard it over and over in the movies and shows. You know, the the kid who's born into the very uptight religious or, you know, hard, whatever they are, family. They are who they are, and they're not very open. And suddenly, here comes the kid who claims, well, I'm gay. I mean, this is rampant right now as far as information. It's wonderful we're getting it, but I always feel sorry for the families because some of them don't know how to handle it. And yet, does the gay person suppress that? Does the person who accepts who they are button down and not talk about it and go away? Sometimes they have. 
But I think look at the lesson learning that that subject matter in itself has started to change the world. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot better, frankly, than when I was a kid. They never talked about it. The only time we ever talked about people of that persuasion is if they were in show business. It was okay. You know, it, that brings back memories for me that we used to take joint showers with my sisters and I just because we could get in and out faster. And yeah. there were five of us and we all wanted to get done because you had to <laughs> bathe after you took a class or a ballet class or whatnot before you could go up for dinner. And so anyway, my little sister jumped in. She's five years younger than me when she was 10 years old. So I was 15. She said to me in the shower, you know, I'm gay. Wow. And I looked at her and I said, so, you like my body? We're not doing joint showers anymore. <laughs> I said, I still love you, but we're not doing joint showers. And then she looked at me. She says, I'm just teasing. We talked about this in school, and I just yeah. wanted to hear your reaction. Yeah, I, I wondered if that was going to be. Well, but, you know, that's just an example of family dynamics. And, you know, it is what it is, as the Buddhists say, and I kind of like that saying. I have a few friends that are Buddhists, and I I turn to them oftentimes just to hear their take on stuff. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not changeable, but it's adjustable. Well, you know, it comes down to the core of why we love another person and what is it in that other person that attracts us to them. And... I would love to talk to you about this when we come back from this next commercial break, because I'm almost what I think I'm going to say is going to be shocking to most, but it's a different way of looking at relationships. So we'll do that when we come back from this short commercial break. Stay tuned. I can't wait. Your conscious connection to a more mindful world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co creating a more conscious lifestyle. I'm Kathy Williams, host of Sexy Mom Abundant Life radio show on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. On the show, we explore living abundantly in every area of your life. Ways to let go of limiting patterns and beliefs and to step into the flow of creativity and possibility, knowing you are supported by the universe. Mark Twain said the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. The why is hidden in your name. Sharon Lynn Wyeth has created a scientific way of deciphering your name to reveal your contract for this lifetime. And your name even specifies the seven areas that are subsets of your soul's overall goal. Your name identifies who you are to both yourself and others. What does your name say about you? Contact Sharon Lynn Wyatt at info at knowthename.com for your stunning name review. These are the sounds of a dinner. A dinner that almost didn't happen. A dinner now served thanks to people like you. Due to COVID-19, 17 million more Americans may face hunger. Feeding America is helping our neighbors in need. And if you're able, you can too. Donations are being accepted at feedingamerica.org slash coronavirus. Brought to you by the Ad Council and Feeding America. 200 Food Bank Strong. Welcome back to Luminescence, Common Sense Spirituality. I'm your host, Jerome Lynn Wyeth, and our special guest today is Lori McQuarrie. Okay, Lori, this may be shocking to hear, but I really feel that we love the process of relating to other people, not necessarily that we love the person. So let me explain. We love to learn, and we're all here to learn more about ourselves, and by learning by others, we actually learn about ourselves also. And that we 
we grow to love the person because we like to the process of relating to that person. And when we stop relating to that person, or in other words, the growth stops occurring with our interactions with the other person, then the relationship stops. And I mean, there's a lot of complexities and foibles and everything that we go through. And it's easy to forgive the other person or or accept the other person for who they are when you're constantly learning from them and, and it's an exciting learning process. But when you stop learning, then the relationship kind of peters out and we, and we don't interact anymore. What do you think? I like that. I think it's got great base to it. May I give you a little more spin on that? Because I sure. accept what you're saying beautifully. Over the years and talking with so many people, I have found time after time that people subconsciously often pick a partner that is reminiscent of the parent they had the most issues with. Interesting. And interesting that you say when it stops working, that's when I, well, I find people come to the alert stage and go, oh, my God, he reminds me of my mother, <laughs> and I can't <laughs> change my mother. And, I mean, I've had people actually say that to me, so I think you're right spot on. You know, I always think, too, that the parent that was the most forgiving or the easiest one to get along is the one that when we go through our growth spurt and we've got to blame somebody instead of taking responsibility ourselves, we've got to blame somebody. We blame the one that actually loved us the most, took care care of us the most, looked after us the most, because we have the best chance of them forgiving us and amending it later on. So that's the one we're going to blame for our world not being perfect. Well, that and also we blame the parent who was too weak to stop behavior. Oh, that's interesting, too. Yeah, you know, the was, mother that says, right. oh, my God, I know your dad drinks too much, but I could never do a thing about it. You know, I mean, all the abuse stories, you know where we're going with it. And it doesn't all have to be that one. But, yeah, I think, well, we come from where we are. And, of course, well, it's all subconscious. People don't go out and look for relationships that are reflective of the parents who are difficult or whatever. It's subconscious. Well, I used to jokingly tell my kids, Date long enough with enough different people. So you've dated somebody like your mom, you've dated somebody like your dad, and then you've gone and found out somebody who's different, and that's who you end up marrying. Don't marry one of the first ones. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, it's hard. It's hard because you get that euphoria. Gosh, I remember being 18 and falling in love and marrying at 18. What the heck was I thinking I didn't even know myself, let alone the other person. You know, it, it, it's a crapshoot, as they say. Sometimes it is that. But I find the people who really use their intuitive process, just trust that gut feeling and listen to it, have a lot easier road in life the, the sooner they, they understand that and embrace it. So let's go back to families. So do we have a karmic tie with everybody that's in our family? Or could a few people just slip in there and we don't have karma with them, but we want to be around the other ones because we did? Yeah, I think everything's related at this point. You know, there's hardly anybody on the earth plane, I can imagine, that hasn't lived before. And I don't think that means everybody you meet, you know, you have a karmic tie to. What is karmically yours will be directed to you, whether you're looking for it or not. And some karmic ties are tougher than others. Some are wonderful. Some are wonderful. And I think I'd shared the story with you the other day when we were chatting about meeting a woman on the beach in Mexico on my honeymoon who was irritating me because she was talking away ahead of me while we were climbing up a little mountain. And, cripe, she turns around and looks, and she had a big hat on, looked up at me, and she looked exactly like my friend Mary, who had died the year before. Exactly. And the beauty of the moment was I told that woman, I said, oh, my God, you have no idea. You look just like my best friend who died. She said, well, thank you. I appreciate her using me to say hello to you. Isn't that beautiful? What a moment. I mean, I cried. And this woman, who I found so distractingly irritating, (laughs) was hugging me. You know, those are moments that 
No, they don't happen every day. Thank goodness. I think they would get dull after a while. But, you know, just be aware. Be aware and understand that everybody you meet, 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 and something like that happens, occurs, unusual even. There's a reason behind it. And, you know, we're kind of a tuning fork for the universe, using each one of us to say or do something that might help somebody else. And, boy, in these times, don't we need that. Ah, it would be such a blessing. So is every member of your current family also a member of the soul family, or can you be borrowing people from other soul families to fulfill what you come to learn in this group with this family? I honestly don't know. Sounds plausible to me. You know, I, for many years, have believed that was the first one. You know, what came to you was exactly yours and nothing more. But I think there's many, many factors and layers now. Just because of, even though we know time is not always reliable on the Earth plane, they have no time and other factors, um, there's something being built up as we speak now. So I think there's more karma coming in, good and bad. You know, sometimes there's good karma. Sometimes we come back to be with people because it's such a joy. We so miss them and love them. Right. I think that's called Dharma. Dharma. The, yeah. The, Remember the, the good TV part. show, Dharma? Dharma. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was a cute show. I loved that show. Well, you know, it, it sounds complicated, but I don't think it really is. And I, I think if you just trust what comes to you, is for a reason. And that doesn't mean you have to embrace everybody and marry everybody you meet, of course, like you said. You take your time, you filter out, and hopefully you've got, you know, good people, good stock to come from and help you do that. Not everybody does. Some people, sometimes I read the headlines of cases and people, what, you know, they, they've done to their families, and you wonder why would they come in for this time. But it takes, it just takes time. And it takes patience to understand your own. You know, I imagined when I was first learning about soul families <clears throat> that we have our core soul family uh, where we are, um, not on this plane. And then we start putting together another lifetime. It's kind of like a play. And mm-hmm. you start saying, okay, guys, last time you had this part and you had that part and you were yep. the bad guy. And this time, who wants to be the bad guy? Who wants to be the good guy? Who wants to play this part? And then, oh, we want to do this other thing? Well, let's go borrow from that family and see if anybody over there in that group will come play with us and play that part for us. You know, know I always wanted to write the movie script that shows the people sitting around the audition table for the play. And people were reading the scripts of the parts they were going to play. And it would be a movie based on your concept, what you're talking about. And it wasn't until the end of the movie that you'd find out It's all about being reincarnated. Right. And how we, I think so, and how we we get together as a group. And I always thought, too, who loves us the most that's willing to play the nastiest role for us? Oh, that's a tough one. I don't know, dear. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and and I don't want to sit and talk about personal stuff all the time, but... You know, I just look at other people's lives that have been pretty darn heavy, the cases I've worked on, the kids who've lost a parent. And, you know, you can be as spiritual as you want to believe, but when you see and feel the pain firsthand of a child going through something like that, there does come a question, my God, why would this happen? Well, because it's deeper than we know, and I'm not God, I can't judge it. I should not judge it. I give that child comfort. I would do the best I could to see that he had counseling, whatever it took. But to know the whys and wherefores of why stuff happens, I don't know. Sometimes it's, it is from past lives. Sometimes I think for soul families, we might even volunteer to go through stuff we didn't even earn just to help somebody else. Well, I often thought about that with children who come in or souls who choose to have a handicap of some sort. Mm, they teach. That's what I always have told people for years, with a child with a severe handicap. And in nursing, I certainly observed them and talked to parents. And it helped, I think, 
because when a parent heard, you know, this child is teaching not just you, the parents, but everyone around him, compassion, caring, all the things that are so, we think, basic that some people skip over. Right. Well, I remember seeing a highly, highly competitive family where everybody was taught to compete with everybody else. And then there was a a child who was a Down syndrome that came into the family. And I remember looking and saying, and that one can't compete. She's here to teach the entire family competitions, not the way to go, because children with Down syndrome are so loving. Well, they are. And I have talked to many parents who have said just that. She's our special one because she shows us such givingness and loving. And, you know, yes, it's a teaching thing. And I think everything's a teachable moment in life, frankly. Well, I think that's what, you know, excites us about moving forward because we get to constantly learn. So another idea that I was just talking with a friend earlier today, and he said to me, no one will love us the way we want to be loved. No one can do it exactly the way we would like it. And that literally is our spiritual path because it pushes us back into our own nature to look at how can we meet those needs ourselves and really learn to accept and love ourselves. Well, I think the moment you open your heart to another fully, you're loving yourself. It's coming right back at you that wonderful essence and energy going out, especially when we love people without boundaries. And I think that's the toughest one, because people are brought up with boundaries. They're told right, wrong, acceptable or not. And I think when we just look at people and love them the way they are, not just defected in some way, but you know, take a look at families, and I know many good families whose kids have got a drug problem. I mean a huge drug problem. Well, of course, for some people, that's a blight on the family. It's embarrassing. It's horrible. And yet I've seen families become stronger because of that, even when there was intervention and nothing was achieved. They have loved that child who's become an adult with addiction, and they never get any different but they love that person's essence. And the person in the addiction understands, feels it. In fact, I've had them talk to me and say, I don't know why my family loves me, but they do. And isn't that wonderful? Well, it is, because you move beyond the hurt of the parent in you that says, oh, my God, I raised this kid to be this. But this kid made his choice, and he still is. That doesn't mean we stop loving him. We may not love the actions, We might not like the ramifications of his choices, but we never stop loving the child within. So, because not everyone feels capable of doing that, are there spiritual consequences for ditching your family? I think there is. I think there is. Well, if you talk ditching, now, that's a a great metaphor there. (laughs) (laughs) I know people who literally would like to ditch the family. But, you know, we have instances, and I've been through it, and I know other people have, where you have a child who says, excuse me, screw you, I'm not talking to you anymore, I'm going away, I'm going to find myself. Well, when it happened to me, I thought I did, and I still believe that I said, okay, I just want you to know I will always love you, I want you to find yourself, and I am releasing you to let you go. This child was not 12. This child was in her 30s. Six years. Six years ditching the family. And the only good news was that we had some contacts that were keeping us informed that she was okay. But giving her that freedom and the non-restraint of me judging her saying, this is stupid, you shouldn't be doing this. I did none of that. And it was hard not to, because I was thinking those things. But I think when we really love somebody, we're willing to let them go to find themselves. And she's back. She came back two, three years ago. What's interesting is in Vedic astrology, and 
anybody who out there that knows Vedic astrology, yeah, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing this. But when the Sati Sadi um, occurs, that in Western astrology would be translated to when the Saturn is going over the moon mm-hmm. um, in someone's chart, it causes a seven and a half year problem with the parents where the child right. will start blaming the parent and then get madder and madder and angrier and angrier. And it, and it brings up stuff. But what it really means is that that child is learning to express anger in an appropriate way, but first doing it inappropriately. And they could separate themselves from the family. But while they're doing that, they're working through painful stuff that has been throughout different lifetimes, not just this one, and and learning how to deal with their own inner anger so that they can become a more sensitive soul. And so that's a seven and a half year process. So for all the parents out there that all of a sudden your kids think you're horrible and they're so mad at you, just know that that could be in their chart where the Saturn's crossing over the moon, which is a seven and a half year time period. Yeah, well put. And also Saturn solar return happens between 28 and 32 for everybody. So that's kind of like a metamorphosis. That's a change that occurs with people, too. But, you know, I just, it's tough being human. You know, sometimes I think about other planets. There's got to be other places where they do things <laughs> differently. And, you know, shooting around without, you know, wings or I don't know, something. But this, uh, this is the hardest one. And Edgar Casey, our wonderful psychic from many, 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 many years ago, said that, you know, the soul on the planet here is the tough. It's the toughest grind because we have to deal with the physical. I mean, I would like to float around all day long. That'd be nice. Save parking tickets and everything else. <laughs> you just, <laughs> but you know, we got to do this and we walk through it, and it's tough and it's physical, and everything is through the physical. Emotional is even physical. It becomes that. So. I think it takes a lot of times some tough situations for us to realize what it's about. And, you know, it's like I always say, how would you know you ever learned anything unless you went through something to reflect that? Unless you went through a problematic thing that went, oh, look how you handled that. And it's never never perfect. So we're being tested. So we want to find out who gets ahead faster, the solitary monk? Or the person who's constantly interacting with others. And what this is what we're going to find out when we come back from our next and last break. Stay tuned. A conscious lifestyle for a mindful life. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Ohm? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Are you feeling lost, confused, absolutely clueless, no way out, over, under, or through? Then it's time to have the Light Keepers, through their conduit, Sharon Lynn Wyeth, guide you by shining their light, illuminating the right path for you. Let Sharon share the wisdom of the ancient masters to guide you on what is coming next for you and to show you the silver lining in your current circumstances. Contact Sharon Lynn Wyeth at info at knowthename.com for a joyful, info-packed Light Keepers session. 
The United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. At the Equal Justice Initiative, we believe mass incarceration has to end. There is this presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people. We have to confront our history of racial injustice and commit to a new era of truth. There's something better waiting for us, something that feels more like freedom. Truth can inspire change. Please learn more at EJI.org. Welcome back to Luminescence Common Sense Spirituality. I'm your host, Sharon Lynn Wyeth, and our special guest today is Lori McQuarrie. And you can reach her via her website, which is her name, Lori McQuarrie. And Lori is spelled L A U R I E, and her last name is M C Q U A R Y. Again, that's lorimcquarrie.com, and McQuarrie is M C Q U A R Y. You know, I've always imagined. Uh, when things got really tough down here, that God had said to us, I'm going to send you down to earth, and it's tough, and it can be miserable, and it's really, really hard, but you can do it, you know, (laughs) Um, and gave us this pep talk ahead of time. And then I thought, you know what? The, The universe wouldn't do that to us. The universe would say, you have a choice of visiting this planet where things can be incredibly challenging and it can be like you're on a roller coaster ride. Things go up and things go down and there's good times and then there's scary times. But you're on this ride and the reason you would want to take this ride is for its excitement and for what you'll learn and grow and what you'll be able to really learn about yourself and others and be able to love more deeply if you go on this ride. Are you in? Do you want to buy a ticket? We'll give it to you for free. It sounds like the Disneyland of the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. Yes, yes, indeed. And I think when you get to a certain age, and that's what the great part about getting old, there's a lot of conflict about getting old sometimes, but you get to review, and you do put in order. When I when I talk, I love working with the elderly. I did that for years too as a nurse, and it was I enjoyed it because I always loved their stories. And when they looked back on their lives, they would pinpoint the highlights: having children, uh, the things that meant the most to them. And but it is always woven in with some of the sad things too, because that's what makes us more of who we really are. If you've had a loss in your life then you will be able to talk to other people about theirs with real wisdom because you've experienced it. Right. So it comes back to this question. Who gets ahead faster, the solitary monk or the person who's always engaging with family, regardless whether they like those family members at the moment or not? Well, I think intent has a lot to do with it. You know, you like to think the monk is thinking all good thoughts and all by himself and praying sending out that wonderful energy in the world. And you know they've done CT scans on monks' brains when they were doing meditation. And it's very interesting research if you look it up. But if you, if you have chosen to be with a difficult family, just remember, it was your choice. You agreed to come in. Maybe you come in to give, give the difficult family another opportunity to grow. It isn't always because you've done something wrong. I've talked to people and told them a lot of times, you're here sometimes for somebody else's karma. doesn't necessarily mean you're a mess. It might mean that that relative that you go, my God, what did I ever do to her, is learning from you because of the way you're handling the situation. And it doesn't mean pretending you're Susie Sunshine and everything's perfect and you never tell that other person what you really think. Part of it is just the growth of the soul. And some are harder than others. Sometimes your family doesn't change. Sometimes people have to step away when they're adults and go, yep, that was my family, but I didn't get much out of that. And sometimes you don't. It isn't always a perfect thing. You know, when you talked about Susie Sunshine and always saying that everything's great and and always looking at... Everything is beautiful, yes. yes. Yeah, everything's beautiful. Doesn't that affect our health in a negative way sometimes? Yeah, it does indeed. I have believed in holistic medicine for a long time, right alongside the medical orthodox stuff. 
what you feel inside is going to create whatever comes into you. Cancer is anger. Cancer is anger. I, cause you, you know how I figured that out years ago? I used to say to my friends, all my nicest patients are, have cancer. They're really nice people. Well, a lot of times they were just really nice people who never stood up for themselves, took the abuse, took the disdain, whatever it was, and crammed it inside, kept it inside, and then it burst out, came out as cancer. Every ailment in the body, there's a wonderful uh, author, and you probably know of her, Louise Hay. She wrote Heal the Body. And mm-hmm. I used to use it in my workshops. I'd give everybody a copy of the book. It was a little pamphlet. It was wonderful. And every part of the body is affected by emotion. When somebody says to me, how come I got such a sore neck, I'll say to them, who's your pain in the neck? Boy, does that change the perspective. Right. You know, a lot of that's coming out in in the book that hopefully will go on sale April 26th. That's going to be called... And know the name, know the health, because a lot of that are the predispositions to certain health ailments are sitting in our name. Yep. It says we're coming with this personality and these emotions and that all um, illness is based on emotion, like you stated. And I look at cancer a little bit differently. I look at cancer as the illusionary disease of when you pretend everything's OK and it's not, but you're not willing to face the truth. That well, you have to present had cancer well. myself, I'll certainly mull that one over. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think everything is related, and I honestly believe that. I think everything is related. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're in an unhappy situation, a lousy job, a lousy relationship, it's going to land somewhere. Um, I find people often end up um, with conditions with the lungs when they, when they have uh, suppression. It's like okay, so suffocating themselves. If they're in a situation where they ought to be out or speak out or do something, they put it in, they stuff it, and it it can come out with lung diseases. Yeah, kind of I look at that as as grief. That yeah, grief it, is in the lungs, yes. Absolutely. Grief is in the lungs. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and talking about, I'm sorry about this, I can't That's turn okay. this off for some reason. Um Heaven the, calling. Yeah, heaven calling to say, oh, and remember to say this. One okay, so so I'll give you one to think about is that when you were speaking about anger and how that manifests, well, some people that are angry want revenge. And the best revenge program out there is Alzheimer's or dementia. Mm-hmm. We'll get even on these people that didn't love us the way we wanted to be loved, yeah. that we want to hurt. And we will now have these people have to take care of us, and we don't even know who they are. Right. Well, also, let me make a point. You can have people born angry. Yes. People can bring it in from other lifetimes. And you look at this kid, and you go, what, the, what is wrong with him? He's, he's just fighting with everybody. I mean, and it can be instilled. It, bring it in. And that's a big, heavy one for a soul to deal with growing up. But it can be healed. That's what we have counselors for. That's what we have healing methodologies for. Right. Now, I look at that when the moon, when Mars is aspecting the moon in the, in the natal chart, those people are coming in born angry. Mm-hmm. That's how it shows up in the astrology chart for those mm-hmm. astrologers out there. Yeah. yeah, it does. That's why I always had my charts done on my kids. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's a wonderful tool. It was wonderful, and the gal who did a chart for me for my daughter described her perfectly the way she turned out as an adult, tall, beautiful, capable, you know, and I mean, this was a little baby, and I was going, boy, I can't wait for her to grow up and see this, but, you know, there's so many wisdoms and so many things, and that you're to nod to your original question who's doing better good you know the 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 guy sitting in the monk thing or out in the world i'll give you an example i was walking with my sister who's now gone we were walking downtown portland one time and seeing bums excuse me for using the word but that's what we called them then and homeless people sitting on the sidewalk begging and my sister never well she didn't mind giving money to them, but she would be hesitant. She said, what's he really going to spend it on? I said, you know, it's not your concern. 
I said, how do you know that this bum who's sitting here homeless with nothing and just asking for spare change isn't a prophet in disguise? How do you know? Maybe he doesn't even know. But we never know who we're dealing with. That's why we always have to be aware. And I don't you know, know that, if that's a good example or that, not. Well, but. it reminds me of when... If you if you wish to do good and that's part of what you've wanted to do, and let's say that you wanted to help people that had an addiction with alcohol, right. then they're not going to listen to somebody who's never drunk. They're that's going to true. listen to another alcoholic. So somebody's right. going to volunteer to come in and be an alcoholic and then go change lives in that direction exactly. because an alcoholic will listen to another alcoholic. You know, Lori, our time together always goes so incredibly fast. No. (laughs) Again, I'd like to say this is how you get a hold of Lori. You can go to her website. It's lauriemacquarie.com. It's L-A-U-R-I-E. Macquarie is M-C-Q-U-A-R-R-Y. And if you don't have a place to write that down, you know you can always go to the schedule page on knowthename.com. And just look up today on on March um, 4th, it is. And it's always right there. Everything about the show, how to contact Lori, what we talked about, everything is right there on that page. So, Lori, thank you so much for being with us. And we'll thank see you, you again in two months. I know. I loved, I love being with you. That's how I feel. It's not just listening to you. I, I'm there with you. And I think everybody in the audience feels that because you have such a wonderful connection with people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori. The same can be said for all my wonderful guests. Next week, we have Sandy Anast- Anastasi coming back, and we're talking about the Tree of Life. I hope you will join us again. And we always like to end our show with um, the song Shine by uh, D. Lamore, and again, you can hear more of her music at her website, which is d l e m o r dot com. So d lamore dot com. And this is your host, Sharon Lynn Wyeth, signing off. And all that she knew